Now for the final session of Wild Digital Southeast Asia 2022, our last Spotlight Fireside chat session is on Web3 on Ramp Creators and Collectors Take Over. Now let's Im invite Amanda Chua, founder and CEO of Backscoop, our moderator for this session. And joining her is Jason Ma, co-founder and co-CEO of Open. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen. I think you can stay here because it's just the two of us. You do like this? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Hey, hi, everybody. Does everybody know what 88 Rising is? Raise your hand if you do. Most people don't know what it is here, but I think one way to put it into context is everybody knows Beyonce, everybody knows J-Lo. 88 Rising basically has the artists that are basically the Asian versions of what you know as J-Lo or Beyonce level of popularity. And this guy is the man behind it. So my name is Amanda, and I run, a, I run Backscoop. It's basically a daily newsletter that makes it fun and easy to stay updated with everything going on in Southeast Asian tech and startups. And I'll leave it to Jason to introduce himself. Thank you, Amanda. She's a rock star, by the way. Um, if you guys haven't gotten the Backscoop, please sign up, backscoop.com. Yeah, www.backscoop.com. And she started it, and she's only 20 years old? Yeah, I just turned 20 earlier this year. <laughs> Boom, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> and this is the first time her moderating a public panel for a major conference. So. It's also my first trip overseas alone. <laughs> I should interview her. I so. should be interviewing him because he has a crazier story than me, believe it or not. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm flattered. Uh, so yeah, I'm co-founder of 88 Rising, um, serial entrepreneur. So I've started now six companies in the media entertainment tech space. Um, my most recent company is called Eastern Standard Times, and our Web3 platform is called Open, OP3N. Um, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I think that everybody here should get context on actually who you are and what you're doing. Because if everybody thinks what I'm doing now is crazy, I think you should realize that what Jason has done in his life is way, way crazier. One word to explain, I and mean, one key word would be that he actually was involved in gangs when he was starting out his career. Like real, actual gangs. <laughs> they don't have that in Malaysia? Philippines? In the Philippines, I think they do, but I don't know about them. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I mean, the story, Growing up was I, I went to three high schools. I got kicked out of three. Uh, ended up at my fourth, and that's actually when I became a born again Christian and I found Christ and I started a hip hop Bible study. Um, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but my journey's been definitely unorthodox. Um, the best way to describe my career journey is probably when I was seven years ish old. My dad asked me what I want to be when I grow up, and I took out a piece of white paper and I took out three different versions of myself with crayons. And so I drew one picture was me in a suit and a tie and a suitcase. Uh, the second picture was me with a French Pierre cap and a paintbrush and a paint palette. And the third was me behind a church pulpit with a crucifix behind me preaching. And so my dad asked me in Cantonese, like, Malega, like, what is this? And I said, uh, well, dad, Monday through Friday, I'm going to be a businessman like you. Saturday, I'm going to be an artist. And Sunday, I'm going to be a preacher. Well, it seems like you can tell the future because you did all of that. <laughs> so my dad was like Seng Muktai, uh, which means smart aleck. And uh, fast forward 30 plus years later, I basically had each of those experiences at one point of my life. Um, so yeah, so I was, uh, you know, I started venture capital with a guy named MC Hammer. I don't know, you're probably too young to know who MC Hammer is. I know Hammer MC is. Hammer. I danced to his song before. Oh, is that right? <laughs> okay. Does anyone know Can't Touch This? Yeah. Too legit to quit? Um, so yeah, so I met Hammer when I was 17 years old. I, I had this born again experience. I was supposed to go to jail for grand theft. A miracle happened. I turned myself into police. Um, I was hanging out with Southeast Asian gangs and I had this come to Jesus moment where I felt like I had to tell the truth and just get my life right. And uh, long story short, the cop let me go. And then when I went to court, even though I pleaded guilty, they postponed my case three times. And even though I stole like grand theft, like over 150K worth of right. stuff, US dollars. Um, the judge said, even though you plead guilty, you can go free. And uh, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I have to go to jail. And he's How like, did no. you feel at that moment when he said you could go free? After uh, I didn't believe that it. much money. <laughs> I, I didn't believe it. I was just like, come again. Like, you got to be kidding me. And um, but, you know, I was given a second chance of life. And I was like, OK, you know, I want to do something with my life. And so I started this hip hop Bible study in the hood. 
Right. And so every Tuesday night, this Chinese American empty church in the ghetto, um, I would go bring all my druggy uh, clients that would buy weed for me <laughs> in the past. Um, I would <laughs> get all of my Southeast Asian Vietnamese gang friends that I used to bang with. And then I would get my thespian friends that were like in the drama department because I liked entertainment and acting undercover, but I didn't tell anyone. Um, and I would get them to come to this Tuesday night church location. I say, okay, study the Bible for an hour. And afterwards, the auditorium is yours. You can b-boy, DJ, MC, rap, whatever you want to do. It ended up going to over 300 hip hop hit, uh, kids. And, all uh, in the hood. All in the hood. Got them off of drugs, got them off the streets, got them, you know, got them out of trouble. And um, MC Hammer started preaching at this large church about 20 minutes down the road from my house. So I just thought, how dope would it be if I got Hammer to come preach at my inner city hip hop outreach? So yeah. I chased him for six months, finally got to him, and he was like, I'm down to do it. I'll speak, I'll perform. And I'm like, no way, it's MC Hammer. And he looks at me, he's like, young man, what do you do? And I go, I work at a tech startup. He's like, doing what? I go, making websites for small businesses. This is Web One. This is yeah, 1997, before you were born. Um, and he goes, you're Asian. You must know how to use a computer. Come work for me. And I was like, MC Hammer? So of course you would, you, would, you would do that, right? What happened next? So I quit my job. I quit my tech startup job across the map in Cupertino. I became his assistant. And not a lot of people know that Hammer is one of the most prolific venture capital angel investors in Silicon Valley. Right. He was truly the first celebrity before celebrities like Kevin Durant or Ashton Kutcher started becoming celebrity investors. And so I drove him to YouTube when it was five people uh, above a pizza parlor in San Mateo. And they're, he's like, Jason, we're going to YouTube. They're uploading content to servers and we're gonna make music videos on our phones. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then uh, we we're at Twitter. I remember drove him to Twitter and he met Jack Dorsey and it was only two engineers with Jack at the time. He's teaching them how to tether and use Twitter as a forum for questions. Right. Salesforce and it was less than 50 people. And so long story short is his whole thing was Jason, rich content, digital distribution, Music industry is going to go down. Hollywood industry is going to go down. Silicon Valley is going to rule Hollywood, and everything's going to come to the valley. And that was 1997, 1998. 20 plus years later, who owns Hollywood? Right. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. Right. It's completely controlled by tech giants. So that was how I got my start in venture capital. We dabbled and started media companies, music labels. So I got a little bit of everything: media, entertainment, venture capital. Uh, and then we invested, really he invested, in Justin Lin's first Asian American film. So if you guys don't know Justin Lin, uh, you guys all know the movie Fast and Furious, yeah? Uh, you know Fast and Furious didn't get good until Tokyo Drift, right? And so that was Justin Lin. So Justin Lin is the director for the Fast and Furious franchise. But when Hammer met Justin, he was a UCLA grad, and he just had this first independent film that he was making called Better Luck Tomorrow. And he bumped into Hammer at CES on the ground floor checking high-tech cameras and was like, Hammer, I'm sick and tired of Asians being stereotyped in Hollywood as geishas and goonies and geeks and gangsters. I want to make like a real Asian-American cast with an all Asian-American film, script, everything. And he got Hammer's number. And three months later, he calls Hammer and Hammer's in the Bay Area. And he's like, Hammer, I maxed out 10 credit cards. My parents let me all their money. If I don't get X amount of dollars in the bank account tomorrow, they're going to take away all my film equipment, my entire dream, my entire movie project's over. Right. And so Hammer just had this feeling. He walked to the bank, and I remember he wired him the cash, nothing signed. So we don't hear from Justin for like an, almost a year. Right. I'm like, did he steal the money? Did he run away? Is did the he movie getting made? Did he disappear? And I remember I was in the office, and it was like Roger Ebert's Sundance Film Festival gives two thumbs up to young Asian American director Justin Lin, and the movie Better Luck Tomorrow got picked up by MTV Films. I'm like, Hammer, is this the same dude? He's like, no way. This is calls, the same guy you are to. He calls him, and Justin's like, you won't believe it. He's in, you know, he's at Sundance in Park City, and that's the first movie for John Cho. You guys ever watch Harold and Kumar? You know, the Asian and Indian guy that get high? So that was John Cho's first film. That was Sung Kang, who's Han in Fast and Furious, the Korean guy in Fast and Furious that dies and comes back every other franchise. Uh, that was Jason Tobin's first film, uh, who's now one of the co-leads for Warrior in HBO's, uh, HBO Max. And so really, that was like Crazy Rich Asians before Crazy Rich Asians, before right. all this Asian pop culture. None of this had happened before, exactly. And so I watched this movie, and I was like, wow, this is the first time I've seen Asian representation on the movie screen for the first time in my life that actually represented my identity and culture correctly. So right then and there, I got the bug and I was like, I know what my calling in life is. God wants me to represent Asian culture, mainstream media the right way. So I went back to Hammer and I was like, God's calling me to Hollywood. He's like, go for it. 
You've been with me for six years at the time. I've wiped his kids' butts all the way to doing venture <laughs> capital deals and starting like business plans for music labels. And then um, I told my pastor, he was a very conservative Chinese pastor from Hong Kong. And, is, and I was like, pastor, I was like, I think God's calling me to Hollywood. He's like, oh, you are not going to Hollywood. That is not God. That is Satan talking to you. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, you are going to be third world missionary. You're going to ministry. You're going to Bible college. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because this is a time when you were doing, was this a time you were doing exorcisms? Uh, well, that came a lot more afterwards. So long story short was one night I'm with Hammer. You know, we're literally in the studio and I'm completely, compl you know, perplexed. I don't know what to choose. I'm like, Hollywood's on one hand, you know, ministries in the other, yeah. you know, Bible seminary. And he's like, Jason, let me give you some advice. Hollywood's always going to be there. If you go to Hollywood in the spiritual state you're in right now, those demons will eat you up. You won't come out alive. If I were you, go to Bible college, build your character, do God's work, serve the poor. And if God calls you back to Hollywood, it'll still be there. So that's what I did. I ended up did the ministry. Everything. I went to the ministry. So I went to the uh, Fuller Theological Seminary and began getting a degree in uh, biblical studies, postmodern culture, and international business. And then I ended up starting my first startup. It was a nonprofit. We started 300 plus churches around the world in 40 plus countries over about five years. And that's when I was a full-time exorcist and uh, evangelist, if you want to call Can it. Can you tell me your favorite exorcism story from Southeast Asia? Oh, there, there's not enough time. Uh, you, you guys, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, there's really not enough time. Um, uh, there, is, there is a podcast I did with Justin Kahn uh, called The Quest on YouTube that you watched. That I think I might've gotten into that story, but there was one, uh, it's actually documented in a movie I made. This was actually one of the first movies I made. It was a documentary called 1040. And it was actually the spread of Christianity in Asia. And I was in Indonesia at uh, Surabaya, I still remember. Uh, but yeah, there was this 15-year-old girl who was fully possessed, like throwing, you know, 200-pound bodyguards like toys. And um, it's all documented on video. So you can actually see it. And her eyes go fully black and she gets delivered and, you know, all of that. But anyways, save that. This is a tech conference. This is not church service. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that some other time if you want to talk to me in the, in the lobby. How about like your journey getting back into Hollywood and back into tech? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so what happened was I was, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, how in the world did you go from ministry uh, and missions all the way into entertainment and media, like the two most opposite things, yeah. right? It's like the devil and God, right? <laughs> and I was just like, okay. Uh, long story short was, um, I remember when I was about 26, I was getting pretty burned out. And I was in, I was in China specifically. And I remember I was in Shenzhen and we we're like building hospital clinics and schools right. and churches. And smartphones are coming out like blackberries palm trios this was also before your time um and i'm like wow there's like half a billion chinese young people how are you going to reach them all you can't like build brick and mortar churches and schools right so i was like you got to go mobile you got to go digital so i just had this revelation that i had to get back into digital media into entertainment specifically into music which was a whole nother story but long story short was i ended up meeting this uh asian american music manager that managed a bunch of asian american rappers and at the time, I didn't believe there was real Asian American rappers, um, but there was this one rapper called Far East Movement, and, and my friend was like, they're like the Asian Beastie Boys. Uh, if you guys don't know Far East Movement, they had a hit song called Like a G6. Do you guys remember this song? You party to it, pop some bottles, maybe lost your virginity to that song? Sure. Um, and then there was another rapper named Jin, uh, MC Jin. He's the number one battle rapper, possibly of all time, at least top five. And, but at the time, they were not famous. Jin had just got dropped by, by Rough Riders. And um, when I met them, I, I can't get into the details, I ended up investing into the company. So invested in the company and said, hey, let's make like Asian American Def Jam records. And yeah. so at the time, uh, Kev Nish, the leader of Forest Movement, he was producing my album and I do gospel rap, right? And so he was like, yo, your rap's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're not Jay-Z, you're not Eminem, you're Asian, we're not sure what to do. But he's like, yo, you know when you preach, it's really powerful. You thought about just like preaching and praying over the beat. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? And he was like, he's like, just play one of your sermons over that beat to see, see what happens. So right. I played this sermon on YouTube I had over a beat, lands in this crazy cadence, and his hair starts standing up. He's like, yo, this is crazy. He's like, you're like Joel Osteen and Eminem smashed into one person. And this is the foundation for 88 Rising, you would say? Um, it was like 88 before 88. So what happened is I went to the studio, dropped three verses, freestyle preaching, like spoken word. And then he was like, I want to get someone to sing on the hook to make it less religious, like Christian gospel, make it more radio friendly. So I was like, who do you got? He's like, yo, I got this guy that really needs the money and he sounds like Michael Jackson. And I was like, what's his name? He's like, his name is Bruno Mars. 
I was like, and this is Bruno Mars before he was the Bruno Mars, right? What, what was it like? He was literally like, check, it, check him out on MySpace, if you guys know MySpace.com. <laughs> and I listened to him. I was like, yo, this sounds like Michael Jackson. And he's like, yo, I was like, how much? He's like, hold up. Let me call him. So he calls up Bruno, and he's like, yo, four songs. You won't believe this. He's going to give you a package deal, 1500 US dollars. And what year is this? This is 2009. This is 2009. And so at the time, Bruno comes into the studio, writes and records me four tracks, and it sounds so dope. I'm just like, why do I even need to get someone else to sing on it? So we actually released the song, uh, me and Bruno, it's called Love. And I remember it hit gospel charts on Amazon it's before Spotify, top 10. Six months later, Far East records like a G6, gets signed to Interscope. We send Jin on a one-way ticket to Hong Kong with Universal Records for an album called ABC, American Born Chinese. He blows up, becomes the biggest rapper in Hong Kong, actor in China. And then, of course, Bruno just goes to the Super Bowl, literally. Um, and so that was 2009 all the way through about 2012. I then started my next company, East West Ventures, which at the time was East West Artists. It really was like a boutique CAA talent agency and financial advisory. So we did about a billion dollars in transactions when like China was exploding with entertainment market and like billions of dollars were coming in from Wanda and Hawaii and Tencent into Hollywood. So we caught that arbitrage. I started representing a lot of talent like Wang Lee Home and K-pop stars into the Hollywood agencies and vice versa. And that's when like YouTube started picking up around 2000, I would say 14, 15 with YouTube channels. Like, and this is where networks. you started picking up the artists for 88 Rising. I remember that it's these internet stars that you would take in and a bunch of them are actually from Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. So, you know, I saw Vice Media, Tastemade, Maker Studios, Full Screen, All Deaf Digital, which was like an African-American YouTube channel. Then there was MITU, which was like a Latin American YouTube channel. So I met with this investor and I was like, what about Asia? And he was like, what about Asia? He's like, if you put together a team and you put together the plan, I'll write the first check. So I literally went and I met my co-founder, Sean, and he was at Vice Media at the time. I was like, yo, why don't you leave Vice and whatever you're doing at Vice, do it here. We're going to create Vice for Asia. And at the time, because no one understood what business plan, like Asian YouTube channel, I was like, when I talked to VCs, I'd be like, hey, we're doing this Asian YouTube content channel for the biggest youth culture in the world, Asia. And they're like, what is, what is that? What do you mean? I'm like, have you ever heard of Vice Media? They're like, yes. I was like, do you know the valuation of Vice? And they're like, yes. And I was like, what is it? They're like, five billion. I said, we're Asian Vice, we're Rice, R-Y-C-E. Yes. So people started writing me checks. And then at the time, I remember it was Keith Ape. He was the first rapper that we signed out of Korea. Ichima, it was nuts, it was viral. And then of course, Rich Brian, who at the time was Rich Chiga, was literally homeschooled in Jakarta and dumbfounded uh, a battle rapper that we early signed. And uh, we literally emailed them and we're like, yo, we're gonna make you pop in the US. And so we signed them, we did the remix to that stick and then that blew up uh, online, became the number one trending YouTube video. And then that really birthed 8 Day Rising. Uh, it was when we had the rappers react video react a bunch of the biggest rappers at the time it was like Tory Lanez to like Migos like reacting to, to this little Indonesian kid who was homeschooled who was like a Rubik's Cube champion all of a sudden you know it was just like it's getting the star. respect of the biggest rappers in the game how would you say like looking back at your career what do you feel like guides your decisions like how would you know like okay I want to start this 88 rising I want to start this new venture I want to be a pastor is there anything that really guides you back then versus now? Um, I think, you know, I've always had the same mission statement since I was literally 19 years old. Uh, after I saw, I think I was, well, maybe I was almost 20. So after I saw Better Luck Tomorrow, my mission statement that I wrote for my own life was to bridge East and West through media, entertainment, technology, through stories and talent. So that's been my North Star uh, for 20 years of my career. And so everything I do is about that. Does it bridge East and West? Is it through media, entertainment? Is it leveraging technology? Is it telling the best stories of our culture and working with the best talents. And so that leads me into Web3, which now is really, I would say a consolidation and convergence of all these different experiences I've had as a founder and leveraging blockchain and Web3 and the NFT to help creators like the next Rich Brian or the next Joji or whoever it is, or the next Far East Movement, to be able to go direct with their fan base and their community and their followers without a middle layer. Because that's what the NFT does. It removes the middleman. It removes Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, because you can now go direct through a digital contract that keeps everything transparent. And now you can actually just do it yourself. Minus all of the jargon about Web3, I think maybe you could share the impact um, of Web3 to these artists. Like how much do they actually make from becoming a hit song, uh, making a hit song versus like selling an NFT? 
Well, I think it's very early days right now, right? So, you know, people always say Web 1 is right, right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, sorry, Web 1 is read, right? Web 2 is write, and Web 3 is own. So Web 1 is really the ability to read and receive information. So I can click on Google and find information about anything or Yahoo back in the day. Uh, and then Web 2, the ability to write means to publish. So now I'm a YouTuber, I can publish content. I'm a TikToker, right. I can publish content. I'm on Instagram, I can publish content. But the monetization and the value all accrues not to the user or the creator that gives value. But the platform. But the platform. So. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, they own your data. They, data is the new oil, right? This is the most precious commodity in the world, right? And so who owns that? Not you. You don't own your data. You don't own your Facebook profile. Facebook does, right? TikTok, ByteDance does. Yes, the Chinese government owns your data. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> just kidding. God bless CCP. And then... Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, in, in, in Web3, the NFT gives you the ability to own your own data, own your own IP, your own address, your own ideas, your own keys, your own security. And how does it do that, right? It's because there's this smart contract created by Vitalik at Ethereum, which now enables anybody to be able to do things without paperwork, right? It's like, if you look at like charity, for instance, I was talking to one of the top executives of Binance and she's a goodwill ambassador, Ms. Helen High, and she said, you know, when you do charity and imagine you donate $100 of goodwill to donate to some kid in Africa that needs water, how much of that $100 actually gets to the kid that needs water? What do you think? 25%. The other 75% goes to HR and accounting and all this other stuff that's just just unnecessary and exactly. inefficient, right? So she said when she did it with Binance and she did charity and she donated through the smart contract, through the blockchain, how much of that hundred dollars actually got to the person that needed the most? $95, $5 is what costs for the gas fee. Exactly. So I think one of the things that you can think about um, in terms of the platform is that you have this illusion that you're actually making money by being on YouTube, by being a creator on these platforms, but they're actually making money through you. But now with Web3, you can actually make money in your own right without going through these platforms. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. Um, so Blau is a DJ, 3LAU, Justin Blau. Uh, he's one of the first artists to monetize through the NFT. So I think early days, 2021, he did 33 exclusive only 33 of 33 music albums, but these music albums were NFTs, they were minted on the blockchain, and they gave you access to a vinyl record, to his exclusive access to his tour, all these different utilities, and he dropped it on Ethereum, and it sold out in less than 24 hours, and he made over $11 million. And that's all to him? All to him, except for the gas fees, right? And we're talking about, he sold 33 music albums. Okay, now Hammer did the same thing almost 15 years ago, but without blockchain. He was like, Jason, I'm only gonna make 20 albums mm -hmm. and I'm only gonna sell it to 20 Silicon Valley billionaires, <laughs> right? And legit, Benioff and Lorraine Jaws, they all bought one of his albums each for like a million bucks, right? Because they got access, right? And they were one of ones, but that was without the blockchain, right? So now with blockchain, that lives forever. That transaction lives on the chain forever. That's the beauty of it. Now there isn't a copy. I can't pass that MP3 to someone else and still own it myself. When I pass an NFT to someone else or I give it to you, right. you own it. I no longer own it. And that's all recorded. And everything is trapped. Everything's trapped. It's just a better version of what MC Hammer did. It is now the ability to scale, right? Through blockchain, now anyone can do it. That literally, there could be a young next Rich Brian in Malaysia that's literally in his house just making beats. And he's like, you know what? I always share it this way. Like, uh, Warner Music's one of our investors for Open and EST Media, and I was speaking to 150 Warner chairmen and CEOs in Miami a few months ago, and I said, think about it this way. If you're a music label artist, or you're a music label executive, what if you've discovered the weekend before the weekend, and his name was the weekday? And when you discover the weekday, he only had 10,000 hardcore followers on SoundCloud and maybe 8,000 followers on Instagram. But he sold a thousand NFTs to that first hardcore fan base that loved the weekday when he only had 10,000 followers on SoundCloud. And in those 1,000, he was like, you get forever front stage, backstage, access first to my music albums for the rest of my career. And 10 years later, he has 100 million followers. He's now the weekend. He's performing in Super Bowl in the biggest stadiums in the world. And you get to flex and be like, yo, 100% I owned 
weekday before he was the weekend right here in this NFT. It's like more valuable than a Mickey Mantle rookie baseball card, right. and there's utility. It's more, it's more valuable than any signature or any autograph that you could. No, because you get. It's not just a signature. You have proof, and you get access. You get utility. It's like the new Marriott's reward membership program right. on steroids, uh, for you know whoever you love the most. So I think that's the beauty of the NFT. That's the beauty of Web three is that it literally removes the middle layer and it connects the creator with their fans to create a community that builds this narrative or this IP or this career together. And that's the beauty of it. And you're trying to scale that with what you're doing now with Open. With Open. So we're basically a Web3 launch pad for IPs and communities. We replace Discord. We replace Shopify, Ticketmaster, Spotify, YouTube, all on one app. Download OP3N on your Android. Everybody and should your, download it. I tried it myself iOS. earlier today, and I was mind blown. Thank you. I hope you're telling the truth. I am telling the truth. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's very early days. It's beta. It's beta right now, right? But, uh, you know, we're very excited. And for us, is to make the UI UX so simple that it feels like TikTok. It feels like Instagram. It feels like, you know, these Web2 empowered tools, but is powered on chain and Web3 by the blockchain. So that's what we're trying to build is like Web3 chat, like WeChat, Facebook for Web3. I think the beauty of it is that you don't really see that it's powered by Web3. That's right. Just you use Web3 as the infrastructure. End of the day, no one cares about what protocol, whether you're you know, Solana, Polygon, although I have to shout out Avalanche because they're our investors and they're amazing. Um, Eco-friendly, more fast, and decentralized. Um, with all that being said, uh, I think end of the day, it's like, did you care whether it was Netscape, Yahoo, or Google, as long as it worked? Right. right. And I think we're in 56K modem days right now for Web3. The next 10 years, we're going to see the super adoption where the next billion on board. But we have to give them the UI UX that doesn't feel the friction of having to download a MetaMask or go get a Coinbase wallet and figure out how to transfer soul you know, to ETH. Um, so I think in that sense, that's what we're doing. We're building a super app for anyone to be able to monetize and be direct with their communities and be able to manage and control their destinies and tell their stories to the world. What's a unique challenge of building now in Web3 as somebody in media? Wow, you're asking some good questions. She's doing well, yeah? I have to say, this, she's, she's like, first time. Like normally when I do these conversations, I'm just like talking nonstop, but she's like pushing back. <laughs> she's like, no, I wanna get this in. Um, I would say that the most unique challenge right now to build is I think finding long-term builders who want to build infrastructure and protocol for this next wave, right? Because really right now you're looking at about 100 million coin holders that are on Binance, right? Uh, you know, that's only whatever percentage of the world. If you're talking about NFTs, it's even less than that. We're talking about like NFTs has not even reached a million or two million users on OpenSea, right? So it's very, very early days. So right now, what you're seeing is a lot of what we call flippers or coin, uh, you know, crypto whales, where all they're doing is flipping and doing arbitrage around NFTs and currencies just to make money. So you right? would say it's still early days for crypto, even if we are always hearing about, oh, there's so much more adoption now. No, not at all. The adoption is so tiny, it's so small. And so my point here is take away greed, take away quick money, quick flip. Let me launch an ICO, launch a token, rug, take this money, go buy a purple Lamborghini, right? Instead, if people actually going, you know what? There is long-term utility, purpose, value. This technology is real. It's not going in a way. I believe every digital asset in the future will be an NFT. I believe that every asset will have a digital version. And so whether that's your, you know, the contract to your car, or whether that's the lease to your house, or whether that's the art you own, or whether that's your shoe, I think that everything that has a receipt will be a digital asset. That digital asset is an NFT. So ultimately, everything is going to become an NFT, right? What does that mean? How do we build for that long term? And I think Malaysia has so much dev talent here. I met all these crazy crypto cowboy whales in Malaysia. And it, boggles my mind how many of there are you out here um but I just, anybody raise your hand if that's you nobody any crypto whales here <laughs> they wouldn't raise their hand because then they would be doxxed um but my point here is that i i think it's, it's about building for the long term so i'm very actually excited about this crypto bear market and this bear market in general because i think now's the time to build imagine if it was 1997 and you had the opportunity to build google or facebook or build youtube that's where we're at right now, and With that's Web3. what's really exciting. And Web3, we're in the first inning. 
And I think also, like, looking back at your career, what would you say was the highlight? Is there any highlight that you would say? Or you feel like everything's changing, like you're there in Web 1, you're there in Web 2, and you're now in Web 3, so... Yeah, I mean, I was, I'm old enough, I'm twice your age, so, I, you know, I'm Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3, right? And have, and, seen, have been... And being able to see Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, would you say there's a highlight per stage, or you feel like it's just a continuous... I think each... Progression? Each... Each transition from web one to web two to web three was an evolution of decentralization, right? And I think the ability to first get information, then to be able to publish information, but then now to be able to own your information, right? Is all enabled through technology. And what does that mean? It means to me, human empowerment, right? End of the day, technology is to empower you, 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 my mom, my dad, your friend, your neighbor, the janitor down to the billionaire to everyone in between. And this is the one thing for me about Web3 and blockchain when I first understood it was, so you're telling me when I was my friend, Phil, he's my best buddy in the world. And he was the one that got me into the DAO and Ethereum. And he was basically explaining to me that through this NFT, I asked him, so through an NFT, whether I'm born into the Royal family of London or whether I'm born into a homeless man's street corner in Skid Row, if I have an idea and it's recorded on the blockchain that it's equal opportunity. And he's like, yes. I'm like, holy shit. Okay. That means anybody can own their idea. Anyone can own their destiny and no one can stop them because this technology allows for transparency and for their ideas to be original. And so for me, that's my purpose in life is to help people fulfill their destinies, help people to tell their stories, help people to own their ideas and to be empowered and not to have this gap between the rich and the poor and the bureaucrats and the politicians and those that are uneducated. And I think that's a big problem even in this nation, right? And so I think blockchain is gonna enable every human being to basically be empowered and own their own destiny and the course of their careers and lives. Wow, and sometimes it sounds like you still have that heart of a pastor. I am, <laughs> not officially. I drink, I smoke. I'm not, <laughs> not anymore, but there was a time in my life that, it, that, that, that was, you know, what I did. But right now I'm a tech entrepreneur, I'm a media entrepreneur, and, but ultimately my heart is to help people. And I think like one thing that, <laughs> hey, let's Thank give a round of applause for Jason. <laughs> I think one thing I want to know is a bit more of the personal side to you. What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie is a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. Um, it's a black and white film, it's a Christmas film, it's probably the most famous Christmas film in America. Um, it's just a simple story about a guy that gives up his dreams for everyone else. And he thinks, you know, he didn't achieve much in life, but at the end of his life, he realized he actually has this very rich life, even though he's not rich, he has great friends. He has great family. He has everything he needs and everything he did actually mattered. And I think a lot of the times as human beings, we don't think what we do matters. We think we got to be famous or we got to you know, go to a great school or we got to have our parents like say, you know, um, but end of the day, I think as long as you put your heart in it and that you don't do what you're afraid to not do. So I always say failure is not trying, right? I think the fact that you didn't go to university, you took a year off, you said, F it, I'm going to go work at this random startup. And then now you started the number one Southeast Asian tech newsletter at 20 years old, you did it. Thank you. Right? And, and, and you're probably, this is going to be probably one thing of like 20 other things you're going to do, right? But I just think, end of the day, you have to follow your passion and follow your heart and not be afraid to try. And your version of success is that? Just trying, just giving your best, right? Whatever you do, give it your best. I think it was Martin Luther King had some quotes like, you know what? Whatever you do, be the best at what you do. And if you're going to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper that ever existed. And I just feel like failure is one, not trying. Failure is also being mediocre. And what I mean by medi being mediocre is allowing those negative thoughts and those doubts and what people say and what the world says and your environment says is because you're here, you're born to this environment, this family, whatever, you can't know. Everybody can. You just have to try and you have to just follow your ideas. It's about um, creating your own destiny, as you said earlier. God is good. And I think just to close, one question I always ask people for basketball when I interview founders is what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Mint chocolate chip and Haagen Dazs coffee. I don't know. Sometimes it's like in between, but if you're Baskin Robbins, mint chocolate chip, when I'm on the road, and I'm, it's Haagen Dazs coffee. 
because you can't find mint chocolate chip. But if I had to have an ice cream cake, it would be mint chocolate chip, Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. Would if you eat those at the same time or just one at a time each? Uh, I would do both at the same time. They're great. Absolutely. Hey, well, thank you, Jason. Thank you for sharing everything that you're doing. And I'm so excited to see what else you do at Open. Thank you. And give it up for this young, thank you. rising Southeast Asian rock star. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you, Jason and Amanda. That was such a great session. Now that concludes our conference for today. There we have it, guys. I can officially call it a wrap for Wild Digital Southeast Asia 2022. Put your hands together. It was an amazing two days filled with knowledge sharing and gaining and a lot of networking. Thank you so much to each and every one of you here for joining us over the past two days. We hope you have gained a lot of insights. If you missed sessions today or yesterday, or would simply like to rewatch your panel, all playbacks for day one and two are available on our website. Now a huge thank you to all of our sponsors, media partners, community partners, friends of the group, Thank you, and remember, the Wild Digital Finale Party will take place tonight <laughs> wow. at, EQ at EQ at 8 p.m. First 150 drinks are on us. We hope to see you in the future Wild Digital Southeast Asia conferences. There remains only one more thing you can do, and that is to enjoy the networking session at the Ballroom Foyer, powered by Hanneken. Join us for drinks outside and continue to network. We hope to see you all soon. Thank you for your energy over the past two days. It has been an absolute pleasure to be your MC at Wild Digital. I hope to see you all soon. Wild Digital signing out. I'm Preeta Manivanen.